Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Nazami, and I'm presenting on behalf of uh, Sahel Oncology for an exciting topic, skin cancer, and specifically, we will talk about uh, malignant melanoma, uh, which is the most malignant type of skin cancer. And uh, specifically, we will discuss epigenetic therapies that we have discovered uh, in the recent years and explore um, more of an understanding of biology of this disease and how we can address um, related subjects. So as far as myself, I'm a graduate of uh, USC, UCSF uh, <clears throat> residencies and fellowship. I have uh, been practicing for about 23 years. I'm a medical director of Medical Centers of Hope and Sahel Oncology. I have um, been the inventor and the IP holder for over 47 patents globally for a technology called multi-targeted epigenetic therapy. I'm a speaker for the CARES Laboratory investigator for uh, best case series of National Cancer Institute and uh, principal investigator for some projects with the National Institute of Health and the co-author of the textbook of integrative oncology published in 2014. My main areas of interest are epigenetics and um, uh, uh, least toxic and most effective treatments uh, for cancer. Uh, malignant melanomas are basically a category of the skin cancer that uh, is m thought to be mostly related to the UV radiation as uh, it can increase the um, stem cell activity for the neural, uh, neural crest cell precursors. It is the fastest growing tumor in human. It is uh, the most common tumor type in whites and is also most aggr aggressive form of it. Uh, the incidence has drastically increased uh, recent years despite uh, the early diagnosis and all the technologies available for screening. Uh, progression of disease to a deadly phase is um, regulated genetically uh, and epigenetically. And the reason that I bring up the percentages here for 60% and 100% is mainly because epigenetics are involved with the genetic regulation uh, in all cases and epigenetics are involved with uh, the influence of um, environment. And as such, you can claim that uh, any type of malignant melanoma is epigenetically driven. Stages of mel melanoma are either localized, regional, or distant. Uh, this sort of staging categorization is uh, outdated. And I will explain um, further on on this topic and how and why we think that this sort of staging is uh, now less useful. Uh, well, we call it genie in your genes. When we talk about epigenetics, we're talking about what uh, the function of the genes are, what you don't see in uh, genes, but uh, yet you can relate to the genetic function. So if you imagine two uh, identical twins when they have exactly the same genes, one gets cancer and the other one doesn't, it's because one of them has the genetics that are differently functional than the other person. That's why we call it genie because pretty much initially when the epigenetic terminology was used by Apostle, it was a philosophical term related to what is not being seen. So uh, the difference between a melanoma to a metastatic melanoma is that when the melanoma goes to the phase of progression and distant metastases, there is a sequence of event that happens that are all related to the stem cell activation, EMT process and oncosuppressor failure. Uh, P16 uh, retinoblastoma pathway is always disrupted and this usually happens with cyclin dependent kinases um, telomerase activation and immortal phenotype, uh, P10 loss and RAS activation has been seen and contributed to the progression of disease, as well as loss of e cadherine and increased beta catechin to y mentin ratio. These are all um, cascades that are involved with notch one pathway. If you are familiar with the genetic uh, network in cancer, you know how 
the uh, wind pathway by snail and slug is activated by the notch one and it goes down to EMT through fibroblast growth factor activation. And in that pathway, you see that the uh, tumor starts to become more aggressive, mesochymal type and uh, being able to disrupt the blood vessels and metastasize. Um, as far as diagnosis, uh, nowadays we have uh, very good technologies that some are commercially available, but most unfortunately aren't. So if you look at uh, mRNAs, microRNAs, 21, 221, 155, that are related to cutaneous lymphoma and squamous cell carcinomas, uh, are detective testings that you can do pretty much in the serum. And this would contribute to an ideal diagnostic test that just by liquid biopsy, you can identify the risk and stratify patients who are at risk for metastases. Standard of care testing cannot predict the progression from a mole to the metastatic disease, as you know. So when a patient uh, shows up with um, just a mole, everybody thinks that, oh, you can take care of that. And nobody knows when and in what uh, cases this uh, metastatic melanoma will happen just uh, after that. So early diagnosis uh, basically is not in the main interest of the pharma because as if you can imagine, if you can prevent by a simple test from a catastrophic event later on, you can really make a difference. And uh, the uh, unfortunate fact of the matter is that the pharmaceutical companies are not interested to invest in prevention. So it's not a focus to treat microenvironment and growth factors, which are mostly involved with this phenomenon. So this is practicing mainstream oncology. Unfortunately, it's still in the box and uh, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, and nowadays immune therapies are still considered the mainstay of treatment for this condition with the majority of cases failing. So examples of target therapies here, for example, BRAF, which is 50% uh, of the time V600E present and can be treated with um, encorafenib and bionetinib with 16 months survival in 63 patients of patients total benefit in less than 32% of patients, meaning that even on the patients who do respond to these, to these targeted therapies, at best, you can have about 16 months survival. That's only one out of three. So IL-2 and interferon alpha with response rates of less than 10%. And you can appreciate the fact that with all these low percentages on response, they're still claimed as to be breakthrough treatments. And uh, every day you hear Oh, and there's a new immune therapy, there's a new CAR T treatment, there's a new TVEC uh, treatments and TLR9 drugs, which are coming uh, to the market under investigation. These are all therapies that unfortunately they have shown uh, catastrophic results in majority of the patients. So, uh, for example, in PDL1 negative cases, you have less than 10% response. Um, and the list goes on and on and on and uh, even the investigational drugs such as toll uh, ligand road uh, nine and uh, rest, uh, receptor nine and cancer vaccines in phase one they have they haven't been really helpful in um, treatment of active disease rather than prevention of uh, recurrence so epigenetics uh, as far as terminology it means beyond genes the history goes back to apostle as i said in 1940 um, it was described more in details uh, when we talked about the chemical reaction that happens in the genes that makes them transcriptionally silent or expressive. The art of epigenetics in melanoma, uh, basically there's 100% aberrancies reported in malignant melanoma pathogenesis. We talked about that, which uh, has to do with these sort of markers, uh, histone deacetylase, histone 3 lies in 27, uh, set, D, uh, set DB1, EZH2, and BRD2. Uh, terminology of epigenetics, we talked about that a little bit. Basically, uh, we know how the DNA in double-stranded is packaged into the dynamic structure of chromatin and is transcriptionally controlled by these chemical reactions of the CPG islands that are located uh, inside the histones and they are basically the targets for treatments that work on epigenetics. And um, 
the signal transduction pathways of methylation, acetylation, ubiquitination, phosphorylation simulations are the main epigenetic modification paths. Um, Waddington, 1940, uh, established phenomenon, as I said, in biological processes, not only for cancer, but also for other conditions. Uh, epigenetic inheritance system is a non-DNA variation, so it argues against Darwinism, and it also um, is an inherited form, but yet completely uh, reversible. So genetic uh, interactions with epigenetics. Epigenetics by itself is a carcinogenic step. A lot of data coming out that shows that uh, epigenetic variations cause mutations, meaning that uh, mutations in the genes um, are a second uh, event or effect caused by uh, genomic methylation. And uh, further, we call this genetic control over epigenetics as it goes the other way around as well. Cancer is an adaptation to environment. Everybody who is interested to know why we get cancer, obviously it's mostly related to an environmental uncontrolled change that we have uh, day by day and the genetics are not able to adapt as quickly as the genetics are exposed to the environmental changes. And so it creates a selective advantage for the species who are adapting with different genetic expression. So hypermethylation and transcription silencing of suppressor genes has been shown in majority of melanoma cases that uh, again speaks for itself. So uh, epigenetics are involved with cancer uh, prevention, carcinogenesis, metastasis, progression, response to treatment. So if it's surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, pretty much epigenetics plays the backbone of any treatment that you propose to the patients as they can regulate the response to cytotoxic therapies, and um, studies that we have independently done in our laboratory has shown significant chemosensitization to our, uh, to our anthracyclines, alkylators, mainly platinum, epirubicine, uh, and temodar. So epigenome is uh, consisted of the chromatin, which is DNA-associated histone proteins, transcriptionally permissive, which is open, transcription repressive, which is closed, uh, and then micro, uh, micro uh, RNAs that are small interfering RNAs are therapeutic by downregulating the DNA methyltransferase. So when you're talking about micro RNAs, they're not used only by, for the diagnosis purposes, but also for treatment purposes as they can change the DNMTs. So this is a good uh, example of caterpillar or butterfly uh, phenotypic called conversion that it happens during the physio physiological growth and development of the organism. As you can see, the phenotypes are completely different, but they are just controlled by similar genes, same genes basically that express them themselves differently in different stages of the lifespan. Uh, this is another example of genetically identified mice that uh, basically are born to identical mothers and fed differently during the pregnancy. As you can see the outcome and the phenotype and predisposition of different conditions such as diabetes and obesity is different based on uh, maternal diet. So precision oncology challenges is that mostly is a molecular targeted approach, uh, meaning that it's a dichotomy between using a blind shot treatment that's based on type of tumor versus its profiled uh, uh, customization of the treatment based on the liquid biopsy. So when you use uh, different sort of technologies such as next generation sequencing or in old days, DNA microarrays, you can really get an understanding of what epigenetic markers are there and you can basically use your treatment based on that. What we do in our clinic, for example, is that we collect the circulating tumor cells from the patient with metastatic disease. And at points of time, we see that patient with localized disease has also micrometastatic disease and then we evaluate the mRNA of the circulatory tumor cells in specific laboratories that we have helped them to identify these targets. And then based on that, we come up with a plan of care that is targeted to the epigenetic markers. Secondly, most of the driver genes mutated or amplified are not actionable, meaning that the standard of care does not provide uh, actual drugs for non-actionable targets. And as such, it's a big failure. Uh, so, if there is an actionable target, the variety of the targeted therapies that are used as 
so-called precision oncology unfortunately failed during the feedback loop activation and it causes recurrence of the disease. And uh, that is the main problem with uh, mainstream customized treatment or precision oncology is that although targeted drugs are used, but they only are beneficial for a short period of time. And then finally, uh, this molecular profiling usually happens late in the stage because of the insurance coverage. So where are the targets in melanoma, uh, tumor genomics, epigenetics, microenvironment molecular targets, and stem cell targets? These are all targets that you can go after depending on what the behavior of the tumor defines. For example, on microenvironment molecular targets, uh, in our clinic, we have uh, 90 to 100 percent success in uh, suppressing EGFR, FGF2, VG, VGF, TGF beta alpha, and hepatocyte growth factors. So you see all these growth factors that are prognostic. They contribute to the tumor uh, progression and uh, patient demise are pretty much controlled by uh, epigenetics. And as such, you can uh, change the environment and the response to the treatment with epigenetic treatments that I will go over in a minute. So survival in melanoma is target dependent, meaning that inhibition of tumor growth and metabolic activity, inhibition of tumor recurrence and inhibition of tumor dissemination, they're all dependent on molecular targets and they all are prognostic. So where is the tumor resistant originated from? So when you're using radiation and chemotherapy, you basically are causing tumor resistance. And um, chemotherapy not only increases the resistance to the radiation, but also it goes vice versa, meaning that radiation also can cause chemo resistance. This is what we see not only in melanoma, but also in other types of cancers, such as brain glioblastoma. Interestingly, alkylating chemo agents increase the transcription resistance targets, such as hypoxia and disposal factor one, which stimulates the activation of stem cells, making radiation less effective. So that's why chemotherapy makes the radiation um, ineffective. The common knowledge, the combination of chemo radiation is a good idea, is not questionable for the same reason. You know, old times we thought that if you combine chemo and radiation, you get a better result, better results because chemo is a radio sensitizing agent and radiation improves chemotherapy response. That's an absolutely uh, disputed argument. What about radiation itself? Radiation and EMT, obviously radiation increases the beta catechin and uh, basically inhibiting the wind, wind pathway, which reverse the invasive phenotype induced by radiation, meaning that wind pathway is activated by the radiation and as such, by inhibiting the wind pathway, you can improve radiation response. That's what we do in our clinic again, by inhibition of wind pathway. There's no commercially available drug to do that, but we have treatments that actually does that. Several studies have been reported to the relationship between wind beta-cadetin pathway and the stems-like cell uh, phenotypes. Cell migration increases with radiation. So when you have um, migration assays after radiation, you see that these cells will start to walk. And interestingly, radiation also increases the migration through activation of same signaling molecules and further stem cell activation uh, through the BMI. Radiation is also an epigenetic disruptor by reduction of microRNA 128. So when you're doing radiation, you're pretty much shooting yourself in the foot because the epigenetic um, of the tumor will be in favor for the tumor metastases by reducing the microRNA 128. So mRNAs uh, are, again, short non-coding RNA molecules. Um, there are a list of different microRNAs that uh, they are involved with progression of disease and the list of them that are involved with uh, interleukins that are suppressive. And also you can uh, correlate the genomics of the tumor with the microRNA. For example, microRNA 137 correlates to the KRAS uh, activation of the tumor. Uh, the microRNAs are also used to differentiate subtypes of melanomas. So again, that uh, helps us again with the pathology understanding of the tumor. Um, so at times, you know, the uh, melanoma also metastasizes to the brain, which is a very hypoxic environment and stimulates the stem cells and basically activation of the stem cells and the role of MMP and VEGF receptors in metastatic melanoma in the brain is obvious. Role of multi-target epigenetic therapy. This is the therapy that we have discovered. It inhibits the snail and slug, inhibits the EMT by inhibition of NOTCH1, 
inhibits the integrin, inhibits the HIF1, Wnt, as we talked about, Hedgehog pathway, the stem cells, and inhibition of migration, which is the most uh, we're interested in, specifically after studies that we've, been, we've done in the MD Anderson. Uh, so MTET studies on melanoma, um, it, there are a wide range of targets, as you can see. Uh, we know now that 70% we can you know, reduce the liver metastases by targeting uh, the same targets. Our studies have confirmed that apoptosis also independently and synergistically with standard of care increases when you're combining our therapy with conventional treatments. Market target epigenetic therapies uh, are outlined as patented formulations, non-toxic with positive side, side effects. So there's no uh, toxicity, improves patient's quality of life, it's extremely effective and low cost. And challenges are obviously trainings for the oncologists and webinars and AI program, which we're working right now with IBM to uh, create that platform to train other oncologists so they can use the same algorithms we use day to day in our clinic. This is a, 60, a 76 years old uh, stage four metastatic melanoma we treated. Uh, so he was um, diagnosed three months before we saw him. Uh, there were no uh, prior treatments and we started him on MTED. In two weeks, uh, we basically uh, checked uh, the markers. Um, she was a female uh, patient and um, I recall that uh, on the day that she started the treatment, uh, she had very low natural kill cell activity it was less than five by flow cytometry. We checked it after five days of treatment and uh, it basically came up five times normal. VEGF dropped to normal in two weeks after treatment, which is a marker of angiogenesis. As you know, patient experienced no side effects with the MTET treatment. Uh, I wanna show you some pictures. Uh, so this is her. This is um, her malignant melanoma on the skin, as you can see. It's widespread disease, she has stage four, and as you can see, all these lesions that you see in the back are metastatic melanoma. And this is Friday after five treatments. As you can see, it's pretty much all cleared up and granulation tissue recovered. Case two is a 51 year old with history of stage two melanoma diagnosed in 2004. And, um, he basically had the cancer recurred and uh, in the right axilla in 2015 was removed, 28 nodes, 14 were positive. He started with uh, immune therapies and then um, his scan in 2016 showed extensive involvement of the right axillary and lymph nodes, SU reactors are really high. All over um, his neck, thorax and SUV activity is measured again in the lungs. And um, he was, uh, otherwise asymptomatic, except that he had these uh, lesions and bumps. His lab showed a positive circulating DNA for NF1. We started him on the treatment after we measured circulated tumor cells, which were positive for c -kit. S1 or B was elevated as 120 prior to the treatment, and then further 430. As we started him on the treatment, we monitored his response. His uh, PDL1 was negative. Uh, labs were checked post-treatment. Uh, as you can see, S1 or B went up to 430 and it dropped to 270. The CTC showed resolution of CK completely disappeared. IGF-1 dropped to 161 from 216. Uh, his circulating DNA um, dropped to 0 0.2 post-treatment from 2.1. PET scan showed that he achieved a complete remission with resolution of our original metastatic lesions. And uh, uh, again, his S1 and B came down this time to 70 from 432 and further to 53. His PET scan was repeated, showed complete resolution again, this time in uh, November 16. And um, uh, this uh, was a really good case. And uh, we will look forward to treat more patients with similar situations. As we speak, I have another patient with uh, stage four metastatic melanoma to the brain I'm treating. And uh, so far we're getting very good results. Thank you.